Good morning. Let's stand and worship together. That's a song that we, I just love to wake up to the morning to, just gets really getting going. And what a beautiful day it is just uh, with the sun shining. Feels like we've been missing that on a few days over the past month or so. But I'm so glad that y'all are here at CCY with us to worship together as a body of believers. What a blessing it is to do that. Coming off the back of, of Easter and Resurrection Sunday, um, there, there's a lot that goes into it and a lot of energy that goes into it, but it's good to re-energize and to be reminded of all the blessings that we have and just coming together and worshiping our God. My name is Chris Miller and I'm one of the pastors here at CCY and I'm glad for each and every one of you being here whether on person or watching online. We actually have a link typically on our online streams to where if you would click that you can get to know more about us. But if you're here on person, we have some little QR codes on every other seat as well as some connection cards. So you have the opportunity to get to know us and we have the opportunity to get to know you. If you do fill out one of those cards, we have a little black box, little black metal boxes at the back of the auditorium. If you would put those little cards in those, we'll get to um, you know read through whatever prayer requests that you have or any questions you may have about us. 
and we'll be able to get to get back to you. And if you have not already gotten your communion cups, we have some here at the front and we have some as well at the back. Let's continue in worshiping together this morning.
Good morning. So I was thinking while I was sitting out there, I feel like I've been running all morning. I don't know if any of you feel like that, or all week, or all month, or all year. But one of the things I enjoy about communion is there, there are times when I'm sitting there and I actually stop and just take a breath, right? And so if you want to do that with me this morning, let's just slow it down, take a breath, right? So for the last several weeks in Sunday school, we've been walking through 1 Corinthians 11, which covers communion. And we've done an in-depth study into what communion is, how it's to be taken, all of these things. And I told James this morning, you know, you'd think after doing that, I would know what to say today. Um, but I kind of struggled in what I wanted to talk about this morning. But then it hit me. One of the things that the Corinthians had problems with that Paul tried to address was there were people in the Corinthian church who were claiming to have a higher Christian status than others in the church. So they claimed because they had a certain knowledge or wisdom that they were actually closer to God than other Christians. And it caused a huge amount of division within the church. And what Paul tries to explain to them is that your status is not made before God based on anything that you bring right? When we come to this table every week, we bring nothing to the table. God brings to the table. And what he brings to the table is Jesus Christ himself, who died on the cross for us. Our status before God is only dependent upon our belief in Christ. That's it. And so when I was thinking about this, I actually, it led me to Hebrews because I think the author of Hebrews really hits on this idea of Christ and what he'd done for us. And so before we take communion, I just want to read this call to perseverance and faith that the Hebrew author says. He says, therefore, brothers and sisters, since we have confidence to enter the most holy place by the blood of Jesus, by a new and living way, open for us through the curtain, which that seems to be a theme running through today, right? The torn curtain. that is his body, Christ's body. And since we have a great priest over the house of God, let us draw near to God with a sincere heart and with the full assurance that faith brings. Having our hearts sprinkled to cleanse us from a guilty conscience and having our bodies washed in the pure water, let us hold unswervingly to the hope we profess for he who promised is faithful. And so I think that's kind of my focus today for communion is let's just focus on the one who is faithful and the one who brings us to the table. Let's pray. Father, we thank you for today and we thank you that we can just slow down in this moment and we want to just thank you for Christ. We want to thank you for what he did on the cross for us. We want to thank you for his sacrifice. We want to thank you for your plan of salvation for each of us. And Father, we know it's through your faithfulness that we are able to have our faith and profess our belief in Christ. And so, Father, we thank you so much for that. Father, as we take communion, just help us to stay focused on him being the worthy one, not on any worthiness that we think we might have or any status that we think we might have, because we know it's all through Christ. It's in his name we pray. Amen. Let's pray for our offering. 
Father, thank you that we can have this time just to come back and give to you. Um, we say it all the time here, but we believe it, that you've given us everything. It all comes from you anyway. And so, Father, this is just a time and an opportunity for us to, to, to continue worship and to worship you by giving back a little bit. And so, Father, we just pray that you'll take this offering, that you'll use it just to grow your kingdom and for the glory of your kingdom and so that your name will be known throughout the world. Father, we love you. We thank you for Christ. Amen. It had been three long days. The echoes of the cross still filled the air. There was a darkness that was palpable, a sense of dread that was all-consuming. Fear permeated the landscape, powered by an inconceivable loss. Hope was dead. But in the distance was a sound, the sound of earth moving, of foundations rattling, the sound of God taking back the world he loved. Darkness had been flooded with light. Fear had been overtaken by hope. Death had been swallowed in victory. In that moment, sin lost its power. The grave lost its sting and evil was left broken in defeat. He is victorious. He is triumphant. He is risen. Jesus is alive. And that makes all the difference in the world. I don't know about you, but that really, I needed that. What Ryan said, take a breath. And maybe that's something you and I can do every Sunday, every Wednesday we have those opportunities too, that we can come together and we can take a breath and we can fix our eyes on Jesus, the author and perfecter of our faith, and be encouraged, and be encouraged, and encourage one another. Welcome. Glad you are here. Welcome each one of you who is here in person, those who are tuning in online. I believe... There are many verses, there are many passages of Scripture that we need to hide in our heart, that we should be able to recollect or bring to memory, at least paraphrase. I think there are many of these verses will help get us through those difficult moments. Let me give you one. You could say John 3.16. Many of us know that. Many, if you kind of want to be an honorary person, you can say John 11.35, Jesus wept, the shortest verse in the Bible. But how about this one? Romans 8.28. And we know in all things God works for the good of those who love him who have been called according to his purpose. It does not mean that everything is going to be good for you and for me. But we can take heart because he has overcome the world and we can overcome the world through him. We need to remember those moments. Last Sunday, I don't know if you got the memo, but last Sunday was Resurrection Sunday. Did you get the memo? Did you hear that? And, and if you will, that was the pinnacle of the Christian faith. I don't think that's a hard sell for you. That's not a hard sell for me. And it was this mountaintop experience. But I don't know about you. I've, I've been on the mountain with God several times in my life, but I usually realize that after the mountain comes the valley. Have you ever felt that way? And what we do, these moments that we are in the valley can be defining moments for you and I in our faith. Defining moments. Today, we're going to be in Matthew chapter 4. If you want to turn there, I'd love, love it if you would follow. But I want to give you a couple examples, biblical examples 
of this refining process and the reality that, um, you know, the, it would be great if the prosperity gospel were true, but it's not. There's going to be difficult moments. Listen to this. The title of the series is Through the Desert, Moses. Let's talk about Moses, the great leader in the Old Testament. Exodus chapter 19, verse 3 says this, and this is such a cool phrase. Moses went up to meet God. Now, just think about that for a second. And, and over the next several chapters, we know in um, Exodus chapter 20, God, with his own hand, if you will, um, inscribes the, the, the Ten Commandments. And right after that, it said there was thunder and there was lightning and there was this mountaintop experience that Moses experienced. I'm like, wow. I mean, no one can see um, the Lord and live, but I can't wait to one day just fall before him and see the glory of God. But Moses had to come off the mountain. Do you remember that? Several chapters later, I think it's Exodus chapter 32, he comes down the mountain. And you know what he finds? The people in their um, um, haste, in their frustration, in their lack of fortitude, fortitude, if you will, they made a golden calf. Do you remember this story? They made a golden calf and they began to worship it and they, how quickly they forget. Moses can I say this from the pulpit, was more than a little ticked off. He kicked the golden calf into the fire. He sprinkled it down. He got it into little bits. He poured it over the water and made the Israelites drink it. He was not a happy camper at that moment. How about this biblical example? How about Elijah? Do you remember that story, that great passage of Scripture in 1 Kings chapter 18 when um, he is having this um, altercation, if you will, with the king at the time? And the king, he basically, Elijah says, you know what? Go call the prophets of Baal, the prophets of, Ash, prophets of Asherah, and, um, which were false gods, which people worshipped at that time. By the way, people still worship false gods today. I, you know that. I know that. And, and Elijah calls him together and says, let's get two bulls. If Baal is God, follow him. But if the Lord is God, let's follow him. And these, um, these prophets of these false gods, hundreds of them, are um, cutting themselves, the Bible says, and praying to Baal that Baal would bring fire from heaven and would um, um, singe, would burn up this altar. And the Bible says in 1 Kings 18, this is great, this is great, um, that Elijah begins about noon to taunt these people. Perhaps that's where trash talk came from, is that moment. But he taunts these people, and he says, you know what, shout louder. Maybe, he's, maybe he can't hear you. Maybe he's out traveling. I love what one version says. Is this okay to say? Maybe he's out relieving himself. And um, as the narrative goes in 1 Kings 18, obviously Baal is a false god. Nothing happens. And then Elijah prays to the Lord. And fire falls from heaven and not only um, just singes and burns up the bull, but everything around it, including the water. The mountaintop experience. You turn the page into 1 Kings 19. What does it say? He was running for his life because the king's wife, the evil queen Jezebel, got wind of this and said, you know what, tomorrow you're going to find yourself like one of them because all those false prophets had been slaughtered. And Elijah is running for his life in 1 Kings 19 and he goes to a cave to hear from God, but his prayer was in that early narrative of 1 Kings 19, Lord, take my life, I want to die. After the mountain comes the valley. And this happens time and time again. The prosperity gospel would be wonderful if it were true, but it's not. And today we are going to read the narrative of none other than the moment in Jesus' life when this um, 
this valley happened, if you will. But there's something incredibly spiritual about getting away, getting alone, and where transformation can take place. Matthew chapter 4. Do you know what happened right before Matthew chapter 4? What happened? The baptism of Jesus, his baptism. And I just want to read this before we get into Matthew chapter 4. This is verse 16 and 17. As soon as Jesus was baptized, he went up out of the water. At that moment, heaven was opened and he saw the Spirit of God descending like a dove and lighting on him. And a voice from heaven said, this is my son whom I love with him. I am well pleased. And there is this process, this process of pruning, this process process of the Bible says refining that we go through. Um, if we were going to talk Christianese, we would say sanctification, but it's a great word that means being set apart because God is completely holy and you and I are to be set apart for him. I found this. This is from a devotional, Our Daily Bread, and the author is A. Parnell Bailey. Listen to this. I thought this was cool. A. Parnell Bailey visited an orange grove where an irrigation pump had broken down. The season was unusually dry, and some of the trees were beginning to die for lack of water. The man giving the tour then took Bailey to his own orchard, where irrigation was used sparingly. These trees, he said, could go on without rain for another two weeks, he said. You see, when they were young, I frequently kept water from them. This hardship caused them to send their roots deeper into the soil in search of moisture. Now mine are the deepest rooted trees in the area. While others are being scorched by the sun, these are finding moisture at a greater depth. See, there is a, there is a biblical truth here that you and I need to better understand, and it will be on the screen. The desert Wilderness experiences of life force our spiritual roots to go deeper, or they should. This hardship, this adversity in this world, Jesus said, you will have trouble, we cannot necessarily avoid. But they force us to lean in and trust Christ like never before, to pray. And that's why it's so important, my friends, that we have a community, a biblical community, where we can encourage one another in that. Here's some examples. The Israelites wandering in the desert. Joseph was locked up in a jail cell. Jonah was in the belly of a well. Daniel was in a den filled with lions. There are times in life that you and I have to face the reality and look in the mirror. And stand on our faith and trust God to provide. But these can be transformative moments in your life and mine. It is this word called sanctification, being set apart. I love this out of Hebrews 12. Keep our eyes, fix your eyes on Jesus. We look to the author and perfecter of our faith, who for the joy set before him endured the cross. Those desert moments, my friends, are going to come periodically in your life. And if we listen to the voice of God, they can be incredible, teachable moments. When you and I are facing a desert wilderness experience, the first thing will be on the screen. Let God lead you. Let God lead you. There are a lot of stories about people finding themselves in this wilderness and listening and leaning in and hearing the voice of God. It might be a difficult season they're in, but it can be a great moment of great teaching. And that's the thing. You and I need to remain to be teachable, teachable. Some things from being taught, reading, seeing it happen in other people's lives, I am inspired by people who go through difficult moments and they might tear up and well up, but you know what? They're holding on to faith and they're trusting in God like never before. That's inspirational to me. So today we're in Matthew chapter 4, and my subheading is the temptation of Jesus. Maybe some of your versions, depending on which one you have, it says the testing of Jesus. Matthew chapter 4, verses 1 and 2. 
Then Jesus was led by the Spirit into the wilderness to be tempted by the devil. After four, fasting 40 days and 40 nights, he was hungry. Now, let's just pause for a moment and back up because I don't know if I've ever really fully grabbed a hold of this until I really started looking into it. Because some of these things, maybe we didn't hear this way in Sunday school growing up. Jesus was led to the wilderness by who? By the Spirit, by the Holy Spirit. I always imagined it, thought, you know what, he, Jesus was in the wilderness, you know, he was fasting, he was hungry, and the enemy came in to prey on him in a weakened state, which is, um, I think, partly true, surely. But he was guided by the very Spirit of God. And there was a specific reason he was there. Do you see it? To be tempted by the devil, to be tested. That was the reason. The condition of his body, he was fasting. Everything else comes secondary to the fact that he was brought by the Spirit of God into that moment. We know from Scripture, Luke chapter 2, verse 52, and Jesus grew in wisdom and stature, favor with God, favor with man. Do you know that verse, Luke 2, 52? He grew intellectually. He grew physically. He grew spiritually, and he grew, grew socially. But these experiences and situations he, he found himself in, even at this moment, would help him grow in that. There was purpose in the wilderness. There was purpose. And maybe, my friends, with Jesus, in this, our hero, our savior, in that very moment, maybe you and I can be encouraged. There can be purpose in our wilderness too. We might not understand at the time. And I know just by looking out and looking into some of your eyes, you've got stories, you've got testimonies about how God redeemed and brought good out of bad. Not everything was good, but God redeemed that. There's purpose. Not too long ago, it was in February, my wife and I got a chance to get away on, on vacation. And many of you know this story, but I came back and I did a 24-hour turnaround where I... Um, did a little laundry, I packed the car, and I jetted off to Joplin, Missouri, my um, old stomping ground, and I went to preaching and teaching convention. And I hadn't been there for, for years, and it was a wonderful opportunity to, to network, to see some friends, to hear some great preaching and teaching, and go to classes and stuff, and it was awesome. I was on that mountain. And then I drove home. And... Um, I, home is my favorite place to be, but just coming back off that mountain type experience, I'm going to be very transparent with you. I was under spiritual attack. I was discouraged. I felt defeated. And I went from the mountain to the valley. But those valley moments can be defining moments for you and for me because God can speak to us in those moments. We must trust God and stand in faith where he is taking us. A friend of mine gave me um, uh, a sign, for lack of a better term, that I have in my office to this day. Isaiah chapter 43, verse 2, and it says this, When you go through deep waters, I will be with you. That's verse 2. Verse 5 says this. This is the Lord speaking. Do not be afraid. I am with you. Do you think there is something he wants to communicate? Let God lead you. Our first step. Our first step. If you Google variation of phrases like hardship, character, true nature revealed, you're going to get probably a long list of quotes, essentially all saying the same thing. And is this, that hardships and difficult times reveal what people are truly made of. And there's something about adversity that lowers our walls and shows what is truly going on inside of us. And so often, people... Um, 
I think probably everywhere do this. I've done this at times in my life. We put on this thing called a mask. And we walk and we pass by, maybe in the neighborhoods, maybe even at church, and say, how are you doing? I'm good. When everything might not be good. I um, got a online communication card recently, and it blew me away in a good way because this person was so transparent and vulnerable about stuff in his life that had taken place that brought him to this moment. Um, I can't tell you lucky to be alive. He's thankful to be alive. And if you read that testimony, and it's his to share, not mine, to tell, that it is amazing going through all that and being transparent and vulnerable and saying, man, look what God has done. Look what he brought me out of. Look what he brought me through. And some of you might not have exact testimonies of this one person, but you have a testimony too. But sometimes we tend to put on a mask Jesus is tempted three times, and his response every single time is what? Quote the word of God. And Jesus goes to the word. He finds strength and boldness, and he fights the lies of the enemy because he will try to talk to you. He will try to convince you, as he will me. And Jesus stands strong on the truth of God's word. Matthew chapter 4, verses 3 through 10. The tempter came to him and said, If you are the Son of God, tell these stones to become bread. Jesus answered, It is written, Man shall not live on bread alone, but on what? Every word that comes from the mouth of God. Then the devil took him to the holy city and had him stand on the highest point of the temple. If you are the Son of God, he said, Throw yourself down. For it is written, this is the devil talking here, which means we need to step up our game. If he's quoting scripture, granted he misquoted it, it's from Psalm 91. He will command his angels concerning you and they will lift you up in their hands so that you will not strike your foot against a stone. Jesus answered him, it is also written, do not put the Lord your God to the test. Again, the devil took him to a very high mountain and showed him all the kingdoms of the world and their splendor. All this I will give you. That's an interesting thing. He's the prince of the power of the air, the Bible teaches, but you know what? There's the king of kings and the Lord of lords that is certainly above. All this I will give you, he said, if you will bow down and worship me. And Jesus said to him, away from me, Satan, for it is written, worship the Lord your God and serve him only. From verses 3 through 10, we can never forget two very simple things that should jump out and pop at us. One, the word became flesh and dwelt among us. This is John chapter 1 says, Jesus was tempted just as we are, but he models what you and I should do when we are tempted. Run to Scripture. Run to Scripture. Don't take what anybody else says, me or anybody else, but always compare everything to what God's Word says. I um, was talking to somebody the other day, and um, this lady was um, a few years older. I think she was 81, a few years older. Um, But um, she said she would love to read her Bible, but she can't see it. And um, the older I get, the more I um, relate to what she's trying to say because it's hard to read. And I'm going to try to go through the library and find her a large or now I guess they make a giant print a Bible that we can get so she can turn the pages and she can be in the Word and read God's Word. We must know it, people. We must be in it. We can't just starve ourselves and get a little spiritual food on Sunday to Sunday. We've got to be feeding ourselves throughout the week. Psalm 119 verse 11 says this, I have hidden your word in my heart that I might not sin against you. God's word helps us fight sin, helps us fight temptation. 
We are in the middle of um, something pretty special that happens every March. Some of you might not care about it. Some of you might care too much about it. But it is the final four. And um, I like basketball. I've watched a little bit of it. But I've been a little captivated, if you will, by this Iowa women's team. I'm, I'm watching, just, and, and I think, um, I hope my wife affectionately is annoyed by it because she's like, you didn't really care about that, but I'm just, the story, everything. When you think about this team, these teams that have gotten this far, there's a phrase I heard a long time ago, um, one of my um, heroes said it to me, and, and it's become even more and more meaningful, preparation precedes Performance. So you think about all these times in exhaustion, they've done drills, they've um, gone to the free throw line, repetition, they've worked at it, worked at it, worked at it. What if we took that view when it came to studying scripture? That we would go to it, repetition, time and time again if we're struggling with something. We are going to stand on the truth of God's word no matter what. What if we tried to hide it in their hearts, and we could memorize it. Some of you, I know you might think, well, I just can't memorize. That's a bunch of baloney. I've told you before, I stood up here, but I've said, you know how many 80s rock group songs I've got stuck in the back of my head? Man, memorize it. Find what works for you. Put it up in your house, in your workplace, on your phones. Index cards are a great way to do it. Write it on an index card. You can tape it on your bathroom uh, mirror. I, 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 in Bible college, they make you, for a grade, memorize lots of scripture. At the time, I found it, can I be so transparent with you, a little annoying and a little hard because it's not easy to memorize large chunks of scripture and, and lots of it. Now, I'm really thankful I did. And the older I get, there I go again, I'm starting to repeat myself, but the older I get, you know, the harder it is to jump back and pull back and pull that out of my, uh, out of my head and say, I remember that. But I can most of the times kind of chart where that is because I was encouraged the discipline of memorization. You can do it too. You can do it too. What verses should we know? There are lots of different ones. I, I, I could share a couple resources, which I won't, but lots of ones that would be great for you to, to hide in your heart. What chapters would be nourishing for your soul? I mentioned Romans chapter 8. I know I've talked with John Miller about this, but that is one of the most, arguably one of the most important chapters in all of the Bible. You can't argue against the Gospels, the words of Jesus himself, but it's, it's, Romans chapter 8 is amazing. Reading the Word of God is key to you and I. Um, um, keep on keeping on, if you will. And Satan even tries in verse 6, you can see it, to misquote some of the verses from Psalm 91. And in this instance, Jesus corrects his use of the verses. Because Jesus knew the Scripture. Jesus knew the Scripture. And that was his first response, not his last resort. When you are facing a desert moment, there's one more thing that I would like to convey this morning. And it's this truth. God will give you what you need. God will give you what you need. We heard it this morning in worship. Um, Ryan mentioned it and stuff like that. But God is so good. He's so loving. And he wants to care for his own. Verse, verse 11 of chapter 4. The devil left him and the angels came and attended him. No one really knows what the angels did to attend him. But there's a principle we see repeated throughout scripture. God is looking out and taking care of his people. Always, always. We see it with Israel in the Old Testament. We see it in the church, certainly in the New Testament. I was just charting over real quick to um, Psalm 121, verses 1 through 3. And this is good. This is good. I lift up my eyes to the hills. Where does my help come from? 
My help comes from the Lord, the the maker of heaven and earth. He will not let your foot slip. He who watches over you will not slumber. I'm glad our loving, great God never has to take a nap. He's always watching over and caring for his own. I think of another moment in the life of Jesus, and you'll remember this too, where he was praying in a garden, mentally preparing for what was about to happen. You remember that? He cries out to the Father asking if there's any other way this could um, happen, that um, what could accomplish what is to come. And in his moment of distress, the Bible says he is sweating out blood. Remember that? As drops of blood. And there's a little phrase that's tucked away in that narrative, which I think is very, very interesting. Luke chapter 22, verse 43. An angel from heaven appeared to strengthen him. And I think I've read that many times, but I think I've missed or forgot that one little phrase. An angel from heaven appeared to strengthen him. And God watches over and attends to us and cares for us just as he did his own son. You'll not yet let your foot slip. He doesn't take breaks. He doesn't step away from his commitment to you and I. I will never leave you or forsake you is what scripture tells us. 1 Corinthians chapter 10, verse 13 is one that probably one you should, and I should know. We should hide in our heart and we should probably be able to bring to mind. No temptation has overtaken you except what is common to mankind. And God is faithful. I'm forever thankful for that. Because even when I'm not, even whenever I have a fumble ruski, God will never have one. He is always faithful. He will not let you be tempted beyond what you can bear, but when you are tempted, he will also provide a way out so that you can endure it. I love that. Here's a great truth. It'll be the last slide. We can overcome because he has overcome. I know many of you in here um, are facing difficult moments, or maybe you're in the middle of this difficult moment. Maybe you're suffering and you're thinking, how much longer can I do this? I was so encouraged whenever we had our Tenebrae service. We're going to do some things different next year. But one of the things I loved about it is we put a cross right down here. And at the end of the service, we had people come up and and say, is there maybe something you're struggling with or something you'd like to be prayed for? All anonymous, of course. And, And I have those in my office. And it's very telling, transparent, and people were vulnerable, and I'm not going to tell you a lot of what they said, but there was a whole bunch of them, and they just wrote this down. The wilderness can be a dangerous place, but can I remind you in my closing last few seconds, it can also be a sacred one, one where you and I can hear from God, can experience God, and can lean into him. It's a place where God brings his people, he meets with his people, and he grows his people. You and I, after the mountaintop experience, oftentimes will face a valley. And you and I need to know that sometimes life will be painful, but you can expect God to be there with you. Never will I leave you, never will I forsake you. John chapter 10 is such a great passage of scripture. And Jesus talks about people leaning in to hear his voice. And and I don't know about you, but I thought this this week as I was trying to prepare for this morning. I am great, and I just shared this with our Sunday school class, with the hope and the resurrection and, and peace and love and joy and stuff like that. I'm really not okay with the thought of suffering a little. But here's what I came to in my mind, and I wonder if you would say the same thing. I don't want to go through those difficult moments, but if I know God is with me, I don't know if there's anything 
I couldn't get through by his power. Would you stand with me, please? Maybe today there's something you are struggling with and you want a community, you want a church family to come around and to pray for you and to encourage you. That is what we want to do. That's who we want to be. In the good times, in the celebratory moments, and in the tough, difficult ones. How do people get through without a church family? For that is what we are. Today, if you have a decision of any kind, maybe you've never accepted Christ into your life. It starts there. But we want to pray for you. After I pray, um, Chris will be here to receive you, and I'll be over here to receive those on that side. Let's pray. Father, we think of that, um, the words of Jesus from John chapter 10, and my sheep know my voice, is what Jesus said. God, help us to discern, help us to listen in, help us to hear your voice above all other voices. There are lots of voices, lots of things that are vying for our attention, our time, God, I pray that you would speak to your people now. Lead us, and we will follow. In Jesus' name we pray, amen. Wagner came up and um, brought um, before me three different prayer requests, um, and I'll mention those all at once, and then I will pray um, for them. Frankie Valens had three very um, intense surgeries, and, um, and we need to pray for, for him um, and, and the family. And then the second one was the Haskell Cooley family. Um, he passed away, um, I think just this past week on April 3rd. And then many of you know, and if you've heard of um, um, Daryl Andrews, the teacher, he's, I think um, Cheryl was telling me he taught here in the schools for 36, 39 years, long time, and, and um, influenced a multitude of people. And so we need to be praying for the family, as I think that his service is this next Saturday. We bow with me and pray, please. Father, we just lift up um, these prayer requests. And that you know, God, we're just reminded of your love for us and we're reminded how you care um, for, um, for each one of these um, precious people and families. God, I pray for Frankie Ballins, who has um, a long recovery ahead of them. Um, and I pray, Lord, after these three surgeries, you just bring healing to um, their body. God, for the Haskell Cooley family, as um, Haskell passed away um, this past week, God, I pray that... Um, your word tells us you're the God of all comfort. I pray that you would comfort this family at this time. 
And Daryl Andrews, many of us knew Daryl and um, um, influenced and affected uh, just so many people um, in leadership class and through the school. I pray that you would just wrap your arms of love and care around um, the family and friends um, at the loss, but I know Daryl was a strong believer. So God, I'm just, we're thankful for that. So God, um, be with these families at this time. In Jesus' name we pray, amen. Ardell had come up and was going to offer a a bit of an update and a praise in regards to her uncle Richard. We'd been praying for him over the past week or so with um, the damage to his vertebrae, but she had let let me know, to let you know, that he was able to go home um, and is able to be resting at home, which is a big praise. We're really grateful for that, but he will be wearing um, like one of those halo stabilizer things for a little while, but um, definitely grateful to um, to where he is able to be home and recovering. So let's be in prayer for Richard as he is continuing in his recovery. God, we're so grateful to hear um, that, Ri- that Richard is in recovery and is able to rest at his own home. Just with any damage to the spine and vertebrae, it's always a, a concerning um, injury. But God, we're, we're grateful for, for your hand in this situation. God, would you just give a, a peace and a comfort to Richard as he recovers and, and that he would get plenty of rest. We're grateful for this, uh, for this praise and we're grateful for you. In Jesus' name, amen. And another thing I wanted to share with you is regards to praises. I know um, sometimes we don't always get to be upfront as to what is going on on Wednesday nights with the youth because we're in separate buildings and whatnot. But something I am really excited to share with you all, just because it's a really beautiful thing that I think we should all take a moment to celebrate, is we had two decisions for first time uh, baptisms with our students. And we're definitely really, really, really excited by that because we had um, tons and tons of kids. Tons and tons of kids that are hearing the gospel for the first time. And so um, after many of discussions, we're, we're getting that scheduled and lined up. So keep your, uh, keep your ears open. We'll probably be coming over to the classes on Wednesday nights, which, by the way, shameless plug, if you're not going to a Wednesday night class, we have plenty of them. So <laughs> we would love for you to, to, to join with us and, and be at our Wednesday night classes. But when we do have those baptisms, we'll be sure to let the adult classes know as well so you can be part of that whenever we do have those. We have a few announcements we would like to share with you on the screens before we close in today's service. Good morning, CCY. Thank you for joining us today. Following service today, we invite the seniors to stay with us for the Senior Connections Potluck. It's a beautiful chance to share a meal and dive into heartfelt discussions. Kathy Stanker will lead the discussion with the topic guiding your children with their inheritance. We're stirring up some excitement with our annual chili cook-off and dessert auction happening on Wednesday, April 24th at 6 p.m. This isn't just any cook-off. It's a tasty opportunity to bring our community together for a night of fellowship, fun, and some friendly competition, all for a great cause. We're close to achieving our Christ and Youth goal this year, needing just $1,300 more to get there. Every spoonful of chili tasted and every dessert slice auctioned off brings us closer to supporting our students in an unforgettable way. So, whether you're a master chef or a dessert connoisseur, we need your culinary skills. Whip up your best chili or dessert and join the competition or simply come to enjoy the delicious creations, cast your votes, and maybe take home a sweet treat from the auction. Remember, it's all for helping our students reach their CIY goal. Mark your calendars, roll up your sleeves, and sign up at ccyok.com slash chili. Feeling called to deepen your connection with our church? Join Clay for Next Level, a class designed to guide you in engaging more fully with the Christ Church of Yukon community. Whether you're new to CCY or seeking a deeper involvement, this is your chance to explore our faith, discover how you can contribute, and make meaningful connections. Our next class is on Sunday, April 21st after service, with lunch and childcare provided. Don't miss this opportunity to grow with us. See you there. 
Have a blessed week. So many different opportunities to get connected and to get engaged in different things that we have going on at the church. And speaking of that, I was encouraged by my small group to share an opportunity that's happening today. For any young adults that, is, that are interested, we are meeting as a young adults, adults small group and we are eating breakfast together for lunch. So we have all sorts of different, <laughs> different breakfast foods, uh, all sorts of different chaotic things, including some bacon-related named food, of which I was told not to name it. But if you want to know what that bacon-related food is called, you have to be there to know. So we'll let you know if you end up coming. <laughs> but we'll be meeting over in the celebrity room, if I believe. I haven't... South building, great. Yeah, no. <laughs> so <laughs> we would love for you all to be there. So let's close today's service in prayer. God, we're grateful to, to come together here to glorify your name, to worship you, and just to be together as a body of believers. May we step forth in faith today, sharing your love with the rest of the world. We're grateful for the opportunities. We love you. In Jesus' name, amen. Have a blessed rest of your week. <laughs>